So we are the integral chat and I think today it's our fifth meeting and today is March, help me out, March 10th, I think. Yeah, okay. And we have uh, thought to, to talk about the levels of development as we have already talked about RED. That was very inspiring. And now we want to begin a little earlier. <laughs> or let's say right at the beginning what is called in spiral dynamics beige. And I wanted to tell you that I just found it now. It took me a long time to find it. I have done a course with John Beck in 2004 in Berlin. And I found all these uh, materials about uh, the levels of development. And if you want me to, to, to read a little bit about uh, that, what he is writing about beige, uh, then I will do it. But first, I think we do a sort of a check-in. Everybody, how are you? What is going on in your lives? And what do you think about uh, what the discussion about beige will enlighten you? Well, I, I like these stages. Uh, I find it gives a lot of clarity on the uh, evolutionary personal development and I used it with a client last night that has food issue. And I went right to the um, food as a basic. And so when she revisited that part of her life, she was able to see how she got caught up in the compulsive part of eating, even though she's you know in her 60s. And um, that seemed to give a resolve. And I think, again, that clarity of the different stages, you know, um, uh, I find it very useful. And the thing I'm still confused on, maybe today I guess some clarity, is the uh, lines of the development, you know, the multi-intelligence. Uh, do they correlate with wherever the person stage, or can you be in a different stage in the um, um, emotional intelligence, let's say, versus where you are in your psycho-personal development? You know, I'm still a little bit fuzzy on that. But anyway, that's my check-in. Uh, I'm glad we're discussing this. <laughs> okay. Paul, you have unmuted yourself. You're speaking. Uh, I didn't, but I'll go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about Beige, and it kind of strikes me that um, I have two experiences of spiral dynamics. On the one hand, it's kind of like, yeah, Beige, it's this old caveman kind of thing. I don't, I don't know if that's a bit unfair to spiral dynamics, but like I was thinking about how a uh, huge thing it is. Like um, for me, it opens the door of like nature, um, animals. Um, for me personally, it's a big part of spiral dynamics because of my BDD. And also I think, I guess I'd class that as a bit of a kind of anxiety disorder where you're sort of uh, struggling to like physically orientate yourself and dealing with fear. And I think like, um, it's still really not something that therapy's um, really tackled with. Uh, I think like OCD is a very difficult thing to to deal with in the way that, or the, the way that therapy seems to. Like I've seen kind of Orange trying to rationalise uh, fear out of people and stuff like this, which doesn't tend to work too well. Um, and it's funny. I was thinking about um, every time I mention this, there's slightly less shame about it. But I was um, I've mentioned being interested in uh, games and one of the ideas I had was because I, I work in uh, Second Life which is a bit of a, uh, a niche kind of virtual world was I was seeing this these like sex products and being like that that stuff like really sells really well and it started off a bit of like oh I could get into games it would be easier than going straight into the super competitive industry um, but to be honest it kind of ended up the more I think about it being quite kind of deep and profound and opening this thing of like um, stepping off of this sort of intellectual uh, what's the word like superiority about the sort of lower base instincts like oh if I make a sex game then I'm just being seedy and appealing to people's worst natures rather than actually in some ways that you can reach to the very bottom and if you I was thinking if I actually guide uh, like guiding a lower instinct into the better form of itself can be like a really strong way of healing because a lot of these very basic urges, they can either be like the best of us or the very worst. Um, 
so yeah, it just opened up this kind of huge box and realizing like how how big Beige is. Uh, I think I would segue from from here. Um, to me, one of the interesting thing would be uh, if if we all sort of acknowledged the, the idea that to reintegrate such early uh, alienated levels could bring great benefit to one's own practice. Then my second question becomes: Are there ways we can re-engineer in the way people communicate? Uh, structures of thought that automatically helps that reintegration. The other time you showed us about nonviolent communication, which seemed to be like a, a really simple way to help the mind engage in these processes. Uh, and so working in tech, uh, I, I, I share sort of the, the curiosity of Paul is, you know, we have Facebook and all these things and they don't seem to do anything in terms of supporting us in the way we communicate in actually reintegrating these levels. And I think that that is possible and it's a great opportunity. So then my, basically the, the question that I would launch after the discussion about Beige is, is there a way to sort of globally reown these, these stages and structures with technology or with communication or with conversational patterns and so on and so forth? Okay, I'll jump in next. Um, can you all hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I've, uh, I'm realizing as I've been listening to you folks that I've got beige in my face right now. My brother died on Tuesday evening this last week. One of my two brothers. He was 65. He had not taken care of his body. Uh, he was immensely overweight. He had a number of physical um, metabolic issues and he had pneumo- uh, probably pneumonia. He just while he was alone at home, his, his partner was at work. He just keeled over sideways in his computer chair and she found him four hours later when she came home from work. So my other brother, my surviving brother and sister-in-law, and we've been, my husband, we've been dealing with this and taking care of the, the widow who's in great shock. So it's like my brother, he was an amazing guy with an amazing mind and he did not take care of his body. He was just oblivious to beige. I'm kind of uh, putting this together as I'm listening. And uh, so anyway, I'm checking in and that's what's in my face now. But I have a number of other ideas simmering from what various people have said. It's like um, these different levels are just, they're just chakra levels. They're just part of our energies. And when we're blocked in them, we need, may need to go back and rebalance them. Um, like sexuality, uh, for instance. I mean... It's been de- it's been demonized. I think that's more of a purple of and red level issue. At beige, it's it's survival. You know, it's bodily survival. Um, but uh, well, that's enough for my check in for now. Um, I'd like to dive in next. Um, so the last couple of days, I've been studying for school for uh, my psychology program, and some of the lectures I've been listening to are on um, real and false needs. And um, it also uh, feels very connected to some of the developmental stages that we go through. And um, essentially what the lectures advocate are that real needs are um, needs for growth and uh, connection or friendship um, that is supportive of that growth. Uh, So that implies lots of things like love and um, respect and uh, attunement. Um, and it also feels very connected to in some of the earliest stages of, uh, development in like object relations theory and and such, um, the sense of self is merged, uh, with the, it's body, our body image, um, our physical self is merged with other. And so there's a lack of ability to really take care of ourself as a separate body. And in later stages, um, our, we may see that we're separate more physically, but um, our, our mind, our, our, our psychology may be merged with other and whatever they think of us is what our reality is. And it kind of continues there with, from there with more differentiation. But um, so what I'm looking at is the, the real and false needs of those very early stages before the, the physical self has been separated. Thanks.
I'll, I'll go next. Um, first of all, I woke up seven minutes ago, and so I will step away in a few minutes to feed the birds and the dog and some, cough, uh, some tea for myself. And secondly, Karen, I'm sorry to hear about your, your brother. That's a shock to the system and uh, certainly a shock to your beige system as he was your, you've known him since you were a child. Was he an older or younger brother? Younger. So no. you know, I've known him all his life. Yeah. Yeah. Very sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so occasionally I have just full blown panic attacks and um, I'm wondering if it takes me down into beige and I had one yesterday. Um, I've had some, some um, big expenses, unexpected expenses come up lately and uh, woke up in the middle of the night last night, not, I'm sorry, night before last, and just set up at 2.30 in the morning and had a hard time breathing. And um, yesterday was a real rough day. And when I have something like that happen, it's really worse in the morning. My body just, uh, it's, I can't breathe very well. Um, uh, I won't go into TMI stuff, but, but as the day went on, I had a weaving class and I had went out with a girlfriend last night who's my business coach. And she's like, well, we can, you know, let's do this and let's do that. And so um, I would, I, I have not had a chance to, to research beige. I'm looking at, at um, the integral life practice and I'm assuming that's infrared. And um, so I think this will be very timely to, to learn about this, to learn how to, uh, um, Natalie, you know, when I get into this mode, I have a heart, I mean, it's, it's, it's survival. It's um, getting down to the real needs of food and safety and breath and, and water. So um, I'm excited about this and I will be popping in and out. I will have you guys where I can hear you, but I, I do need to get some stuff done as we're, we're talking and I apologize for that. And I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Ryan and Kate. Yeah, sure. I'll. Um, so yeah, I'm extremely sleepy. I uh, didn't sleep well last night, and then with the time change, the next thing I knew, I'm like, oh my god, it's already seven in the morning. Um, but uh. Yeah, synchronistically, my, my girlfriend just ordered a book. I'll show it here on the screen. And um, it's basically all about why some people survive when they're like lost in the wilderness or something like that, and why some people don't make it. And one of the examples that the author uh, opens with, it, well, one of his leading questions is, why is it that a 40 year old can get lost in the woods overnight and die while a four year old will survive in the woods overnight. Like you would think at least at first glance that the older more intelligent, more experienced person with a stronger body would have an advantage in surviving. But he said, that's not always the case. And the reason why that's not always the case is because when he, uh, he, he calls the two different types of emotions or two different kinds of impulses. So the first one is your gut instinct. And so when you're in, he was giving examples of people like in World War II, they had, a, they just, they just got down and they didn't overthink it. And then the grenade blew up and it didn't kill them. And then the second one was um, the, your, your reaction to the reaction. And he said, that's the, the one that actually ends up killing people is when you, um, you overthink it. And so what happens with the 40 year old is because you have more stages of development in place that can actually give you a, a disadvantage because you get sucked up in the higher levels of overthinking it or trying to rationalize instead of just going with your gut instincts. So it's what, and the four-year-old, because they're mostly at a more beige stage, that's all they have. So they can't overthink it. And Paul and I were kind of talking about this yesterday about how lower stages can be more powerful than higher stages. And I think this is a great example of how when you're put into a survival situation and if, if you don't let your beige instincts or that beige part of your brain or psyche really overtake you and you just surrender to those impulses, then, um, you things could actually go awry more easily. So I, I just thought that was kind of interesting to think about it. And uh, I just started on the book, but I'll look forward to reading more about it. Thank you. Kate, do you want to say something? Present, introduce yourself, not present. I heard that in English, you don't say present yourself. And I always say it, so introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate. And, um, thank you for holding these calls. Um, 
I didn't get a chance to listen to your last week's call, but it looks very interesting. Um, in terms of beige, I, it kind of reminds me of um, many years ago in Boulder, Colorado. I lived there and I took a, a like a, I don't know, three or four week or two to three, four week class or workshop or training or something with Don Beck on spiral dynamics. And at the end of the training, the room was filled with people that pretty much were stating that they felt they were at the turquoise level, or I don't know if Ken's changed the colors, but that's way up there. And so Don gave us this day, kind of, it was very long. It was like a four hour test that we had to fill out. And at the end of, <laughs> everybody was like convinced they were gonna be, you know, I was gonna illuminate how, un, how not green they were and all of that. And what was shocking to me was the high percentage of beige that showed up in the test and for everyone else too. And um, it was very illuminating and I think kind of discombobulating for the group to see their results. And um, for me, I, I, I work with people that are sort of in the margins of, of society. And so beige is a huge issue and also um, people who have experienced pre-verbal trauma at a very, very early age and how that those sort of uh, shadows and, you know, tennis, they are, it, it, lack of integration shows up, you know, throughout development. So that's, that's always something that I'm really interested in going deeper into and understanding. Thank you, Kate. So you are in Boulder, you said, Colorado. Do you have a, a video camera? Can you show uh, us who you are? If not, I mean, it's not a problem, but it's nicer to see. A little bit. I have a cold and I've been sneezing and coughing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I wanted to, to continue what you said. I, I had done the same course with Don Beck, and I, I wanted to remark that we think stages of development, we are now in green or we are in turquoise or something. And we forget that we are everything at the same time. And when this course came, like, like you, we did this, um, this, this question to questionnaire. And the typical uh, distribution was when here is beige and then, you know, the other colors. Beige, you were like this. And then it went like this. Here we are, let's say, in red and blue, and then we go out again. That would be us people. Uh, the, I think they call it the meme, meme stack or something. And it was so surprising. And we don't re realize, we think, oh, beige is something, uh, you know, mm, not valuable. Instead, it is the basis of everything. And so I'm really looking forward to, to figure out uh, today a little bit better what it is. There were many, many hints already taking care for body or not taking care for body uh, and the needs and so on. So let's dive in. Who, who wants to, to, to start? I had a thought about the way that beige relates up the spiral. Like in some ways, it seems to me the higher you go up the, the spiral, the further you go from the body in some ways. Like I find whenever I look into like really old history, like the kind of how strong and barbaric it is, it, like really kind of like comes across but I think the other side is also true in the sense of like um, <clears throat> our understanding of nature and the body actually increases the, the further up you go so it's sort of like um, I think of like a I've, I've heard of some people like integral um, fitness and health and all this kind of stuff and it gets like so complex and so like incredible how um, much is going going in on the body and also like other people mentioned kind of trauma and Natalie was talking about um, kind of early stages of like being merged with uh, I, I, then you said it this way but kind of being merged with mother it's like all of that comes out of therapy so it gives us this like really deep intellectual understanding of stuff that's I guess being there all the time yeah my my sense of, of how we, we go up the meme stack, I guess we're calling it, um, is we, as we go up beyond red, that's the third level, um, up into uh, the fourth level, which would be amber in Ken Wilber's scheme, and I think blue in the spiral dynamics. As we get up into that law and order, I mean, we become able to repress 
and suppress the lower memes. We have that personality structure, the ego structure, that we can deliberately suppress and repress the lower levels. And at that level, that um, um, fourth level, the, the pre-traditionalist, the, the mon- it, it corresponds with monotheistic religion, we can, s- many cultures really savagely repress the lowest levels, the beige and the red. And that's kind of how we come up out of red is we learn to control it. We tend to do it, overdo it for a while. But as a historian and specifically a historian of the Middle Ages, the Western Middle Ages, how savagely those, some of the monotheistic religions could suppress and repress beige as well as purple and red. I mean, the the kind of mortification of the flesh that was um, done in the name of spirituality, not just in in medieval Christianity, but in other traditions as well, you know, deliberately starving yourself. I think the the Buddhist spent seven years in extreme austerities where he would eat no more in a day than you could put under one fingernail or, you know, flogging yourself or, you know, just, I mean, just horribly repressing the basic, the, the body level. So and I was really interested to hear, um, I forget which, whether it was, was Karen or Heidi who, or which one, or Kate who said that, that there, the meme stack tends to go in kind of a, an hourglass shape and maybe part of our job as we get to the higher levels. And I remember Ken Wilber saying this, that as you get to the, the sixth level, which is the green, you have at least the potential to go back and reown, he called, Ken Wilber called it the centaur, where you go rebalance, you reown the body and integrate it with the mind. But it seems to me, green has its own repressive tendencies. It really represses red and, um, um, well, the blue also. It represses the, the some of the, the pre-modern. So part of our job, at sec- if we want to really be second tier, is kind of maybe have a healthier, um, meme stack like a ladder instead of an hourglass where some parts are, are squeezed and repressed. We can get a healthier stack all the way up, reown the healthy parts of each of them. Thank you, Karin. Um, I think before we go into these discussions, we should first do a sort of a collection at, of what we think that beige is how communication is in beige, how all the other things are in beige, what people need in beige, what, what, uh, how we can address people in beige, all these these things, and what is the beige in ourselves, you know? And then I think we could uh, get it together with the other stages. As I have understood last time that we want to go through every stage uh, uh, to really get clear what it is and then, you know, uh, get them all together. I don't know if it's in your sense, in your ideas too. So for me, beige, yeah, we have already said that's uh, survival. It's the, the fundamental needs. And people who are in beige, for instance, a newborn baby, you know, they are definitely in beige. And what, how can we deal with this kind of person in beige? There are other people who, when they don't have anything to eat anymore, they probably regress from higher stages to 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 beige uh, too. So that's just to throw the topic uh, into the water, let's say, or into the fire, whatever. Uh, What are your ideas? What is the characteristic of a person, small or or even old people, you know, when they lose their senses, uh, they might be going back to totally beige as a level of development. And then we say we have that all in us too. So that's a sort of a difference, you know? If I can share just some thoughts that I've had lately about this. One of the things that uh, was mentioned before um, was this idea that the beige state is is pre-language, is pre-rational. And so the problem is that all the experiences that do happen at that time, they don't get tied to anything really dualistic because there, there really is very little dualism in that stage. There, there is beginning to be the uh, emergence of a body structure as separate from everything else. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is how the earliest the trauma is or the earliest experience is, the, er, the more it becomes tied with your experience of the causal body. Which obviously you cannot experience the causal body 
but you are in a, in a state of witness that is basically has no direction, has no focus. So what that means to my understanding is that if you experience fear at that state, that fear becomes associated with the here and now. It becomes your eternal state of panic. And I do think that, you know, the, the earliest the memories are, the more than that experience becomes actually ever present. And the problem with that is that then it becomes tied to all the other structures and all the other reasons why you should be afraid. But the paradox is that if you turn all of those off, you stop thinking, you stop worrying, that fear may remain. And I think that the problem is that we don't really have good tactics to deal with this kind of experiences. And I think some teachers sometimes are even not giving good answers. I don't know if you, you follow that Eckhart Tolle, some people ask him like, what if I have this, this kind of state of fear? His only answer is, well, you just get to stick with it, which is, which is probably the true answer, but I think it can be explained in ways that make it a little bit easier to think how to deal with these things. And, and I've been working a little bit of like theories as what are the best ways to deal with these really early on sort of generalized anxieties. Um, but I would be curious to see what you know to be efficient tools to reintegrate these structures of the self. I have a, I have a little bit with that. When I, I was looking at the spiral dynamics thing. They were saying that there was a lack of language because it's pre-verbal, which is true. I agree with that. But... To me, it occurs, and I think there's a big window in this, that there is a lot of language at beige. Um, I mean, an obvious one is, is body language. I think of like wolves and things like this. Like they don't go like, get off the meat, I'm alpha, but they kind of growl and they'll bite each other's ears or whatever it is. So there's uh, loads of language. And I think that becomes more, that probably would be a useful tool in relation to uh, helping people with these these traumas and also I kind of I like the fact that you picked up on the causal body Damiano because I think that's very true and I think that's something I've been playing with recently that um, I notice if I end up dealing with very early trauma there's this sense of like sort of uh, being overwhelmed in the ego or something like this so I need a space uh, above my body like all this panic and fear to actually like be able to ride it out and also I think to be able to harmonize the sheer amount of like physical energy um that comes like it can be dangerous if it's not harmonized um like that kind of kundalini thing like it, that, that can actually be really dangerous if it's not uh given this like vast expanse so yeah i appreciate the um the causal causal link because i think that really speaks to some of how it how beige feels as well I'm, I'm not sure that beige is um, without language. Um, in terms of individual development, I, my sense of where, where we open into the potential for the next level up is around age two. I could be wrong about that. Maybe it's 18 months or something. But in terms of human history, the way I parse human history is the species Homo sapiens, specifically Homo sapiens, began about 200,000 years ago. And I think this is open to a lot of interpretation among the, the anthropologists, but my sense of it is that there was some language, maybe not very complex. Maybe they didn't have tenses, past, future, present tense, but I think <clears throat> my sense is there was some language at maybe a more rudimentary level. My sense is that people who are at beige, maybe, you know, um, when, when, do pe when do kids start speaking? Roughly around age one sometimes and moving through age one to two. I think that's still beige, maybe upper beige. Um, I didn't have kids, so I'm not, not positive about this, but I'd, I'd like to include, my, my sense is to include some at least rudimentary spoken language maybe simple commands and expressions of emotion. Uh, certainly in human history, in, in terms of human history, which I'm dealing with because I'm writing a novel set 11,000 years ago, but uh, um, I think language is part of beige, but our sense of ourselves is, I mean, this is, this is in spiral dynamics. We don't really, you know, and we don't really have a separate self sense yet. It's and we have the potentials for all of the levels, but it's kind of like all one big emulsion that's all mixed. 
There's no ability to separate out a bodily sensation, self versus other, myself versus my, my sense of self is very much fused with the other members of my tribelet, and it's also fused in a sense with the environment. So the sense of there is a very, maybe a very rudimentary language and rudimentary self, but it's very fluid and undifferentiated from other me, you, me, it. It's fluid and undifferentiated and can shift from moment to moment. And Damiano, I'll have to chew on what you said because my sense of what you were talking about is that you're in the moment and when the moments pass, there is no past. It's just the next moment. Now, my sense of prehistoric humanity is that a lot of them were, for a lot of them, post-traumatic stress disorder was normal. <laughs> so, they're, I mean, maybe they lived their lives in a state of PTSD. I think a lot of, pre, uh, of animals do. But if, if, this, if, if the moment's past, it, it doesn't exist anymore, whatever. If it's sunshiny and I'm peaceful and my belly's full and it's just happy. And then the next moment, you know, a panic. Anyway, it's, it's, it's I, 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 you can tell I'm... I'm there's, a, there's a key differentiation, and, I, and, I, and I'm happy that you raised the issue. I think that the key differentiation is not in the fact that... I think I, I'm talking about the trauma in beige be, and I correlated it to childbearing. And I, I actually believe that childbearing in the time of caves was much less terrifying than childbearing today. Because in childbearing today, we just assume the child knows that it is safe if you live in a dark room. Whereas, you know, those kind of like uh, skin to skin, constant content between the mother and the child were much more prevalent at those stages. So the paradox is that my, my correlation was really more with like early onset education and how actually the way we've transformed it today is probably creating a lot more chaos in beige than at times in which beige was an authentic issue. And so, uh, and just to, just to throw a concept out there, I really think that the concepts of levels, quadrants and bodies can actually be merged very soon into something that is almost the same thing because the the separation between <clears throat> quadrants is the separation between bodies and the in, initial creation of development here in beige there is no it yet so any fear arises in the eye in an unclear eye space and then you progress from that so i think that there's it's also just very elegant that the beige is the separation is can be mapped as an evolution in our understanding of quadrants, of bodies, and then of, of reason. And I made a mistake before. I shouldn't have said pre-rational. I should have said just pre-verbal. Uh, even though verbal, I mean, they still cry. And I think that since that state is so empty, their communication is very binary. It's just, I'm happy, I'm unhappy. That's it. Like, I cry, I don't cry. And, and, and expressing fear is in itself a form of expression because I'm transferring information about my state of mind, but it's still less complex. I think that, uh, yeah, that's what I meant. This uh, reminds me of hunter-gatherer tribes and um, even present day uh, communities in say Africa or many other um, nationalities where the um, child is held um, by the community and is not put down for most of its early life and how that then um, supports uh, basically all of the uh, development from the parents to the child at that time is uh, focused on uh, the child feeling safe when there's lack of resources. And so um, be when we <coughs> focus on as parents, uh, our child growing up to rational stages at a very young age, we're not focused on the child's ability to withstand uh, physical lack of needs during um, while, while still receiving love and attunement and the ability to grow those those other versions of real needs. There's the physical real needs and the emotional real needs. And so in some ways, uh, if beige is what's on the plate for development, it makes it easier to develop a, a healthy foundation there in beige rather than skipping ahead. Wow, really like that. So 
um, for a panic attack, part of it is feeling um, alone and um, uh, have to do things by myself when I get into that mode. And so what you guys are saying, if there's a parental attention to the kid and or village community attention to the kid, the kid doesn't develop the sense of aloneness. Uh, my mom worked, you know, I, um, and, and she also was not a very, um, she didn't really want to be a mom and, and let us know that every opportunity. And so that's an interesting concept that that's very helpful. And also that's what leads to overeating or all of these other, you know, uh, anything to do with the mouth is a stage of character kind of, uh, oral in Freudian psychology. And you can think of, um, talking a lot drinking beer, smoking, things to fill the mouth in some way because the um, physical needs may have been met, but that's confused with the emotional needs of feeling safe enough when the physical needs are not met. So being left in a dark room is associated essentially with, I won't have enough food to survive, so I need to soothe myself in some way. Yes, I'd like to throw this into the pot. Um, I've thought a lot over the years about the difference between very early tribes where an infant is held. You don't put an infant down for very long because if, if predators don't get it, ants will, you know. The baby is usually held by somebody right against another human body and what a difference that makes. I asked my husband, who's a retired MD once, if he had ever heard of a case where a child died of sudden infant death syndrome while it was being held by somebody, and he got this startled look on his face and said, I guess that's why they call it crib death. Yeah. So I'll just throw that into the pot. There's so, an element as well when you, you brought up uh, tribalism, and I think this is as much as my experience that um, there's an ability to like be with pain that, that seems to be heightened in tribes. Like a lot of them have these um, kind of uh, coming of age rituals where something gets mutilated and uh, so it matches it again come back to Damiano with the cause of body like it seems to me that um, there's something about being in this kind of state of oneness where uh, pain is, is easier to be with um, which kind of like uh, I think helps with the uh, the idea of like trauma because one of the things and I'd be curious um, like other people's experience but for example, like with the physical trauma, there's a sense of like being physically overwhelmed. Like uh, I've sometimes had some minor, I wouldn't necessarily call it agoraphobia because it wasn't afraid of the outside world. It was more afraid of the inner feelings that I would, I would have. But the, this definite sense of like, especially integral because there, there was all this kind of like possible subtle body energy. There's like green emotions and all this kind of crazy stuff. But just like, just this feeling of being, um, just flooded. There's something um, about the language thing that was interesting what you said, Karen, because of course, even in the womb, we probably hear, they've done studies on babies influenced by music and the mother's voice. And I, um, Nancy Verrio has done a lot of work on children that are orphaned and aren't separated from their parent, their mother at birth and how the heightened um, among even adoptees that get adopted into a family later, a loving family, but just even that thing of first coming out, which is probably not the most beige state we could be in and not seeing the actual DNA connected mother and hearing the voice that they've probably heard while in the womb, some sense of that, whatever that would mean, is so um, terrifying and creates lifelong panic and, and huge, higher percentages in orphans that are separated at birth so just uh and and very hard to integrate because it's done like i said at that pre-verbal state if yeah, I can just you can't talk that, somebody out of it in other words therapy the fact that was that you said um thinking in the body the physical um having been an orphan myself that uh when i had a reunion with my mother about seven years ago that when I had the contact with her, there was a sensation in my body of uh, elation or connection that I never experienced in my life. And uh, <laughs> I think that, you know, you know, is, relates to what you're saying, 
And then also in my mind, it was always a feeling of um, not being in place, you know, not having any post uh, sense of ability of being uh, belongingness, uh, even though my the people that adopted me were kind and, you know, and um, def definitely wanted me. But the physiology, you know, um, I mean, all the messages uh, for me were, was, it was all, all in the body. It was all these sensations and all that. And then once I got into some um, recovery work, because they had then put language to it and translate what was going on, you know what I mean? So um, I'm finding the conversation very helpful um, that you guys are sharing. Um, because uh, I, I don't know if I didn't study that much or what, but the uh, I was thinking uh, even now it makes sense what the medical people told me. Um, I just got out of the hospital about two or three weeks ago, <clears throat> and I went in um, at DOA, uh, borderline, um, about 1% chance survival, uh, because I had gotten a relapse through um, Lyme disease, and the uh, uh, my red cells were being consumed by a parasite, parasite that had been rebooted, reactivated. And when I thanked them for the help they gave me, it was a wonderful team. Uh, they said, you're the one that takes the credit because it's the way you took care of yourself or you wouldn't be alive today. You know, because I work out and meditate, you know, all kind of stuff like that. And um, I can see that that's really basic survival, uh, um, you know, at base level, I guess, that I incorporate that. Uh, with my lifestyle, but also that was really the basis of my awakening to um, recovering from the um, orphanage, you know, and the assaults, you know, and all the kind of violence that I um, experienced in my early stage in development. So beige is kind of like, to me, the foundation of it all. Wow, Ronald, that can be really painful and good work with that too. Um, and what you were sharing reminds me of how when I'm working with beige issues myself, I often feel it in my stomach. There's a sense of inability to digest experience. And the way I deal with that sometimes is by putting food there, trying to push it through somehow, but it's, you know, an energetic thing. Um, yeah. I've heard, um, having studied some primal stuff, that um, that's one of the first things that shuts down Nally is the like digestion. Um, it definitely matches my experience. Like sometimes, where I'm, it almost feels like pointless to eat, and uh, it, it does seem like there's something about being locked in the, the freeze response, especially um, seems to shut that down. Also, uh, yeah, I don't know, Ronald. Like hearing you basically overcome kind of Lyme disease or like having your own survival instincts like i could just feel this rush of um um my part of it's obviously like sad and painful but the other part just felt like just this rush of vitality like wow that's such a huge thing to to deal with and to still be uh surviving and to get the credit for that it's just like yeah wow i wanted to, to tie into what ronald and, and kate were mentioning I think that one of the, the biggest problems of issues that arise that early on is that uh, if, if you imagine the brain as a software that has files to interpret reality, and if early on your only interpretation of sort of almost empty states is fear, you could meditate as much as you like, but like, to dip into a state of awakening is to dip in the exact opposite of it. An eternal, safe, love, whatever, right? So I think that one of the reasons why, and I do believe that people who have early on issues, they may have a harder time becoming awakened, is because they just don't have a file for this profound state of, of happiness and joy. Like if I think of my experience of here and now, it's just fear. But it's like, it's just normal. It's like, it's always been only that. And so what I've been realizing lately is that you can do some kind of shadow work with fear, but it is, it, it consists in just imagining the possibility of an alternate state. And I think once we feed our mind the idea of the possibility of a state that has such 
sort of endless freedom and happiness, that actually unhinges something in our head that leaves the space for awakening. And so I, I think that it's really important to bring back the concept of imagination, which is actually very prevalent in like tantric practice and so on and so forth. Because if, you're, if our issues are so early on, which is prevalent in Western society, then there is a greater need. And it is also likely that since we've all been raised in a different way as maybe those Tibetan monks were raised by their mother, that there is a different amount of focus that needs to be placed on certain issues. You know, maybe the Tibetan monks didn't need to deal with certain aspects of their own childbearing while we do. And therefore, certain practice may need to be done more or less by Westerners. Right? And I, I think that this really touches on the idea that <laughs> maybe the way they practiced is related to the structure of their society and their family relations, and we need to sort of upgrade it. Or, or at least um, transmute it, uh, um, adapt, adapt, maybe adapt. I agree that we, we may be wounded in very integrate. different ways. Integrate. There <laughs> we, go. we may be wounded in very different ways than people from different cultures. I suspect different cultures each have their own typical ways of being wounded and being healthy. Um, I'd like to, to chew a bit on something you said, Damiano. The way I imagine this working is that at this very early, the kind of kind of the, the first the first stage of human existence, we have all this potential, but it's undifferentiated and uh, un unless there's some extreme, tr well, no, I, I, I imagine life at that stage over 100,000 years ago as being trauma, ecstasy, trauma, ecstasy, peace, joy. There's all the emotions in there mixed. And I imagine as all of the other potential levels being accessible in a very fluid way, but undifferentiated. And in the wake of our last two conversations, these last two Sundays, I've been cognizing as modern Westerners, if we are wounded in certain ways at the lowest levels, that could potentially leave us open to the transcendent, to being flooded by these other higher levels in ways that we cannot necessarily integrate. But and this is the brilliance of Ken Wilber. We can achieve these, we, we can consciously have these experiences of much higher states, not stages, but states, and still be, if we're unhealthy or unbalanced at the lower levels, um, we won't integrate them very well. But what I'm adding to this in the wake of our conversations is that being unbalanced at these lower levels can open us more to the transcendent levels, where at the intermediate stages where we're developing intellect and a separate ego, we tend to, we tend to be focused on those to the exclusion of the lower and higher levels. So maybe um, being unbalanced in our individual life at these lower levels like beige opens us more to the transcendent. And then that when we see the possibilities, then we can go back and do the remedial work. So in some ways, maybe not being perfectly balanced can open us to growing further. There's something that I like to examine. Um, I gather people who've been through like very horrific um, pain and things, there's, um, they often have out of body experiences like uh, when there's too much pain and from my research where into the primal states and stuff that there's part of that built into nature part of the like freeze response like um if you're a deer and a lion's almost certainly going to rip you to pieces uh there's been studies that kind of there's all these like endorphins and stuff and chemicals that will go into the body so it's kind of like less painful um less painful to actually die and, and also i think like having known people who, who've really struggled with trauma, I think that is true about having access to um, higher states where it can actually be a problem in some ways. Like it's, it's a good thing in some ways because they can experience this stuff, but part of it comes because they have like a total lack of boundaries. So they're just like these antennas just to be able to pick up uh, so much stuff. And also a Damiano just, uh, the, uh, idea the idea of the shadow the words, like, like phantom, phantom. I was thinking I was about thinking like about green, green and um, um make going a bit. Going a bit. I was thinking of I green, green and, 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 and 
Somebody, somebody mute, mute or I'm, or I'm, going, I'm, going. I'm wondering, uh, I think we need Karen, I think it's you, we'll mute you. There is uh, the echo, we need to be muted while the other people speak, okay? Amyani, you wanted to say something, but you are muted, so you must unmute yourself. Oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just thinking about greens and university and all their trigger warnings and stuff like that. Like, it's such an opposite. Like, it would be great to be like, yeah, you're going to have to do some fierce shadow work. Like, just the... And also, I do think that somewhat comes out in Integral because there's something about dealing with things that are terrifying and traumatic that just seems to demand, like, a real ability to be kind of somewhat meditative just to be able to, like, uh, not get, like, totally hijacked yeah, but, but I think one, one of the biggest problems is that Ken Wilber himself said, like there are some instances in which you witness, 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 fear, 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 and it just doesn't go away. That often happens in, you know, if you have a, a single person that is traumatizing you and then you do that shadow work where you inverse it and, and something happens in the brain that allows you to process it. I think just like it's, it's just harder to do it when you have nothing to flip against. Uh, but it is still possible. I don't know if you've heard of cardiac coherence. Cardiac coherence is a, is a, it's like, it's a really cool technique. It's not really well known, but I think it, it, it touches on to something really interesting, which is this idea that if you merely position yourself in a state of safety and positive appreciation with sufficient concentration, at some point, something happens with physiology of the body that actually changes the way your heartbeat operates changes the communication between heartbeat and brain and gets you out of fight or flight response. So that sort of buys to the possible idea that we can heal from these early things by simply just imagining to be doing better. And then there's something that actually happens in our physiology. Uh, just Google cardiac coherence. They, they do a lot of like uh, research also. They have devices and stuff. And I think it's, it's one of those techniques that in the future will probably be way more important than we think just because as Westerners, we also have so much more stress and so much more need to self-regulate on a, on a constant base. I think that also adds to the beige issue is that it, in the Western society, there's so much stress is that it's, it's always getting triggered by, by some new thing. And, and the Tibetan monks on the monastery don't, don't have that, <laughs> that, that degree of stress. Uh, this reminds me of the brainstem itself and polyvagal theory where, uh, like my experience with stress is, um, if I'm really feeling it, just moving my head side to side like this, um, moving the uh, atlas, the base of the brainstem can deregulate the whole nervous system. And without having to try to feel safe, body switches over. Working with that beige brain. <laughs> I'd like to also say something, maybe just to push back a little on what Damiano was saying about Tibetan mo monastery people. I mean, certainly there's a lot of um, trauma that has occurred in Tibet, you know, due to the Chinese invasion. And certainly there's a lot of books out now about talking about the abuses that occur within the monasteries, the feudal system, power abuses. And certainly in the West, we see a lot of Tibetan teachers that have got caught up in the Me Too situation so it's not that, that this is you know this land of free peacefulness totally always yeah a lot I, of struggles, I, politics all kinds of stuff I, I agree i agree i think i should have just said like just a different kind of suffering like a different distribution of types of suffering that makes for just a different focus when it comes to dealing with yourself i think that would be a better way to uh, sorry to, to say what i meant i would okay. like to I, sorry, I would like to say at this time that beige is not all about suffering and fear. It's also about full belly lying in the sun. Life is terrific, yummy, good feelings. Wow. Roll over, grab your partner and roll in the hay. Life, you know, it's, it, there, there's a balance here. Yeah, that I want to, I was thinking about doing that. So I was thinking about like athletes. Like when I was looking at the spiral dynamics, I think that one of the things they were saying with the strength was just like the sheer amount of like physical sensation. Like it actually made me curious, like um, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of athletes probably didn't have terrible, very early stage 
uh, brings. I could be wrong, but it just kind of like doesn't make sense to me that LeBron can just sit there just like swinging three points endlessly if he was like really, really struggling in his early years. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, like I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going three. I'll get I'll it. Get it. I'll, I'll get back. No, Ronald, it was not on your part. Go, go ahead. Everybody else is muted. Okay, it's okay now. Um, I mean, kind of intrigued the going to Ohio State. Uh, one of the things that um, drew me into the Indigo um, uh, perspective of uh, you know looking at it is the um, something awakened for me um, resonated. That is um, about uh, the higher states, uh, the higher self, the um, absolute state, and it seems like uh, what awakened in me is the experiencing those kind of sensations. Um, and 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 um, uh, a sense of awareness um, in surviving. The, it's kind of like you know, I take on human form and have a hard time with it because of the the assaults, the hostile environment, you know, the rape, and and on and on. Um, and so that it's not like I couldn't go outward, so I went more inward. And the more I went inward, was inward, the more it was like what you experience in doing meditation. You know um, that brings you through these uh, stages, uh, state stages uh, development. That um, I think that it it came it came alive to me more because in a way it was kind of one way how I survived, but wasn't conscious of it. I wasn't awake as to um, the uh, that I was going into altered states. Um, 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 uh, and and like you said about being in the hospital, that the uh, time I was there, um, it was kind of like they worked on on me on the human level, but where I was coming from was on a higher level. Uh, now of course I do meditation, so I was able to do that shift, you know, and kind of you know move move further inwardly and just let them do what they had to do with me and all that. But I but I do wonder if people do achieve um, going into uh, altered state development that have had a harder time with the stage developments. Um, and then the more, of course, that sh my shadow work that I did, uh, the more I became integrated and then they all kind of went together. But that's why I love this, pro this whole uh, way of looking at it because it's kind of like the journey that went on, but I wasn't awake with it. You know what I mean? And um, um, I think to me again, back to back to Beige uh, is, is where it all starts. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, Ronald, I, I, I think that's an excellent point and something I find really interesting. And I remember when I was um, in college, I, I lived at a spiritual community called Ananda, and they followed the teachings of a guru named Yogananda. And the entire emphasis of the spiritual path is like, you've got to go up, 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 up. So it's like, you got to bring it to the spiritual line, just like blast off into super conscious, causal, transcendental bliss forever. And of course, that was like the furthest thing from my experience, right? So I've had different like energetic blocks or like tensions in different parts of my body. And eventually what happened was, well, I, I first started with the tension like behind my head. And then it went to my, behind my heart. Then it went to my solar plexus. Then it went down to my um like second chakra like like in my lower abdomen when i was dealing with some issues with like girls and that kind of thing um and then eventually after i left college it went all the way down to like my root chakra right in like my butt and and these people at the uh at the um spiritual community kept on telling me, like you got to go up like don't go down to your butt you're going the wrong way man like you got to go you got to go up to here and i'm like no i'm gonna go down i'm i'm and um it felt like there was a huge gap between like, like I was not inhabiting my root. I was floating above and my entire journey was descending down to meet the root, not going up and up and up. And I remember some of the big spiritual breakthroughs I had were kind of like, like in the spiral, I was going down from whatever center of gravity I was at. I was going all the way back down to beige. And then there was like this, this kind of like we were talking about last time in my fascination with death and how, there was this, you know, you're, you're meditating and you're like, I'm going to die. Like I feel incredibly vulnerable. My ego is grasping for, for dear life. And I, it's just all of your survival and seeing fight or flight anxiety attacks. My I'm, I'm disintegrating. This is really terrifying. 
and and you know Karen and I were talking about the mush in the in in the mushy stage you know of um having a temporary uh, experience of like dissolution of the self and and then that was actually what broke into uh, a higher like state or an experience of sacredness or the numinous or god it was actually from the beige experience that launched me into something greater you know so it, it, i think in in that sense i would like to, i would be curious to see how that would be depicted in in models like spiral dynamics where there's just an emphasis on up and up and up and for me it was like in order to get to the like the transcendent experience i had to go all the way down like physically into my butt and then suddenly i was in, in a higher place so i think that's an interesting uh point you brought up ron when you say that i i get reminded that in, sp in spiral dynamics spirituality is not really included that's more about your social psychological development and I think I, I imagine that that might also have been a sort of a point of disagreement between Ken and 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 uh, Don Beck, who, yeah, maybe also for other reasons. I don't know if I shared that already with you that on, I saw him and Don Beck on the conference in Hungary two years ago, and mm. he didn't make an integral impression. Let's say in this way. <laughs> did or did not <laughs> did not he behaved like a like a um how can you say a disappointed boy and really strange in in in, in reddish ways that's uh, i found and maybe that's going back to beige you know when you get older you might risk to to go backward you know who knows but it was when you know what he has done and what he, uh, you know, what great things he has done, and then see him to be so ah, on stage, <laughs> I thought no. <laughs> uh, Ryan, I agree that going down feels like a more, uh, like a more stable way in a lot of ways, a lot of things um, to go about spiritual awakening that. Um, when you go down, the spiritual awakening happens on its own. It's not something that we need to try to cultivate. And yet there is value for things like meditation, but a lot of that value is also in the integration of what comes up in the silence and the down-regulating of the nervous system rather than chasing a state to try to transcend up to. Yeah, I, I agree. And also, I, I guess I want to emphasize a little bit. I think, I think it's best like both like having uh, the higher stages and the lower stages together. Like I was thinking of, Brian mentioned the book earlier and this thing of um, facing death and a little bit with, with Karen, which she was talking about bringing it onto it, more like kind of rolling around in the hay and stuff. But like, there's something really kind of fun and sexy about facing death or facing fear or kind of, um, uh, there's so many spiritual archetypes of sort of heroes and stuff like slaying dragons and all this kind of stuff. And, um, I think sometimes that can be like the best of the body and the, and the spirituality, like dealing, dealing with death. It's hard not to get uh, spiritual or, or at least um, existential in some ways. Like some people actually get like nihilistic. Um, but I remember like dealing with a few years ago, like sort of heights of my trauma. And I remember like I was, I was out in the countryside. Um, I had two cats and they would like kill stuff on a daily basis and like, bring it in or it would be half brought in like i remember them just dropping this crow just into my bedroom and it was half dead so it would fly around and i remember that like there were times where it was just unbearable just ripped my heart out i remember watching a mouse and trying to i guess i don't know like comfort it on its way and just finding it so tearful to watch this thing die and yeah at the same time it was kind of peaceful like there wasn't as much i was watching it and i was thinking there isn't as much neurotic fear in in this mouse dying even though there's definitely pain uh than there was than there was for me which i think raises raises another layer of beige which is violence because i mean that that's also part of it like part of the survival i, I see ryan ryan is laughing martial artist gets me like just <laughs> just like that, and that is a great way to reown it. Like, I don't know, I, I also have like Ryan and experience in martial arts and just like 
how grounded it makes you feel to know you can punch someone in the face. And it's like, it's sad, but true. Because in the world, people will eventually punch, try to punch your face. And like, to know that you can punch them back makes you feel safe. And I think that uh, this is really also another, I think, important element of, of, uh, of Bayesian spirituality and, and feeling grounded and safe. And the thing is that it's not just about feeling safe in your here and now environment, but in your them and we environment. So in a broader sense, and uh, so, yeah, I think that, that that's one element that needs to be re-owned. I have a clear sense of how that gets re-owned in, in a man. Um, I, I wonder whether there are some gender elements to how does it look for women to re-own this more like strong and violent and like aggressive sort of mother lion uh, spirit, but it definitely is part of it. I never I thought I'd say this, but uh, I completely agree with Damiano on punching people in the face over and out. And I think we <laughs> women would be good if we, we learned that from the beginning, to feel safe on the streets mm. and to, to be able to, to maybe not punch in the face, but like with Aikido, that you just turn the energy around and yeah. that uh, you are not the prey anymore. And, and there are integral martial arts. If you're interested, I can tell you all about it later. Oh, I, I, uh, yeah, that would be really good for women. And I think we women have a, an issue with not, with not expressing directly um, red and violence, but have it, we, we use psychological violence and not direct violence. And I find direct violence more, more, how do we say, integral in the sense more true, you know, than, than all these ways we are used to to do for using our violence and make it appear like so kind. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good topic because for, for women, there was certainly a way to survive, uh, to find somebody uh, who is taking care for you or who is protecting you, you know, with good reasons probably, but how we do that can be, you can perceive it as, as, as violent, who knows. Well, I, my experience in martial arts, which I took up in my late 20s, was because I wanted to feel safe on the street. Because <laughs> I had decided I w could not really depend on any man to do it for me. I was going to depend on myself. And ironically, I had moved to Munich to do my dissertation research and realized how much safer I felt in a European city and how unsafe I had always felt all along in an American city. And so I oh, took up... Yeah a really tough form of martial arts because I figured, and this is you know, male on female violence is qualitatively different than male on male violence. I realized if I was going to take that route, I'd better be able to end the fight with the very first thing I did. So I went for a pretty brutal form of martial art and ended up wrecking my back, but I had a good time for a year and a half with it anyway. It was a great way to get out the piled up aggression of being in a powerless position in graduate school. So I, anyway, in the fiction I'm writing, I'm actually playing with this. Uh, 11,000 years ago, I'm imagining my heroine being very fierce and expressing herself very directly and very physically. And this gets back to what you were saying, Damiano, and earlier about owning the violence, and that's part of beige. Nature is brutal. Nature can be brutal. And the just violence as a way of just feeding yourself and taking care of yourself, and that's part of it. And how do we reown that integrally in a balanced way that serves ourselves and serves mm -hmm. life, but that opens up the juiciness of life, the energy that flows with you. It can be joyful. And, and I think we, we tend to, you know, the Puritanism really repressed that side of ourselves and finding a way to bring that back in can be very life enhancing. So it's, it's a challenge to, to find the balance, but hey, let's go for it. There's something that I want to touch on because I, I agree with um, Heidi and Karen in the sense of like women owning that. To be honest, I think like most people can do and it kind of... Uh, um, somewhat seems a bit green in the sense of like having the genders kind of balanced um, out of it. but like I must admit during the rest of the call I was thinking that there, there is this massive contrast between men and women um, at beige like so much was mentioned about um, mothers and safety and uh, all the vulnerability that comes with that 
which is like very different than the typical beige male role of like having to go out in the wilderness and fight and deal with all these like terrifying animals and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it, uh, I don't know, I think that's like just as valuable as well is the, is the contrast between men and women as well as like having a kind of greenish sort of balance, both genders having a balanced access to, to each other. I'm just thinking about a mother of in animals and maybe also humans in a low, let's say, primitive stage. Um, animals kill their offspring when they are too weak. And I have heard about, uh, I think still somewhere in Siberia, there is a tribe who is opening the ice and a newborn baby, they put them uh, for a short while in the icy water and who survives? Uh, survives. So for us would be, how can you do that to a newborn one? But for them, it's the tradition to see if the child will be able to survive the hard life in that area. So we can call it violence. Probably it is in our uh, point of view, but maybe, I don't know. That's also that we have to, to look on our concepts, concepts, and see if they are really the same in in every stage. They are not, probably, you know, so. Yes, it's true. There are many um, societies, you know, up through, uh, um, up through the fourth level, up through what we call blue or amber, where infants were exposed if the tribe couldn't afford them or if the baby was, if had a hair lip, you know, there are tribe, I may probably still to this day where the elders get together and decide if the baby is viable and then they'll just leave it out if, and you know, no matter what the mother thinks. Um, yeah. uh, is, is the tribe going to invest in this child or not? Um, it just yeah it, it, you in in um the the mediterranean world the ancient world ancient greece and rome you know, you, know you, you still read about exposing infants that the group didn't want or that the the king wanted to get rid of this baby or for some reason uh, up until very recently that was pretty common not our not our contemporary values at all so the values are going to be very different heidi yes the values are going to be very different at each stage and we're actually reversing so many of these structures because we're, we're doing all we can to protect and save people regardless of evolutionary processes. Like the, the wombs, the, the, I think that the, the hips of women are getting narrower because people are, are being born with the cesarean cut. I was born with cesarean cut. And that, that is just changing genetically our, our structure. And so... It's like we have no idea how even the mind will change as a result of these different uh, unfoldings. So, it is, yeah, it's just weird to see where it will go. And I think, again, the um, uh, transcending and including that, you know, when I think of a uh, very survivorship or uh, being a survivor and taking care of myself, lest anyone try to F with me uh, you know, on the street or whatever. Uh, to have that kind of mindset and still be able to be at the higher stages <clears throat> in how I live my life and how I relate to other people, but to not to forget that, that it's the same way when I have clients, you know, I, I see them in my home, I always check in with them, how, you know, how are you with the environment, is there anything I do that you can feel comfortable, but and then with safety first uh, is my concern especially if it's a female, you know, I mean, you know, I'm very concerned, whereas just me as a guy, um, you know, you know, you know, to make sure that she, she doesn't feel overly vulnerable or whatever. But that's back again to that just survival, survival first, you know, um, no matter how advanced we may think of ourselves evolving, whatever, you know, that, that, that root basis of, um, embracing it's part of what it means to be a whole person I think is, is very important and also uh, for me I had to wake up to that <clears throat> issue because when you've been raped um, and and assaulted and violent history you actually don't even I, one may not even trust their body so I had to really do physiological training and um, 
tight, you know, different things that like you guys have been sharing as a way to, to um, reclaim my body as a vehicle that I could trust, that, uh, that, that I can fend for myself. So to regain trust in my body was to get back to beige, back to being strong, you know, and, and physical and resilient and that kind of basics of, 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 of part of my total being. It's yeah. interesting on a bioenergetic level, which is the um, energetic expression of shaping our physical body uh, based on our mental experience and all vice versa nested in each other. So on a bioenergetic level, um, women, like you're saying, Gamino, with narrow hips um, tend to not always have a, a less ability to nurture. And um, the same is true, like, for our sense of connection between our feet and our ankles and the earth, the tension of our jaw, those three, the jaw, the hips, and the feet are all very directly connected. And so one way to work with beige is by doing physical exercises that help um, consciousness, energy, presence, uh, be able to move through there, releasing the tension. I want to bring in a, like a big kind of macro view that I think like integral people can uh, possibly uniquely see, but the fact that the world is like less violent than it ever has been, not to like be blind to the sheer amount of violence that's still there, but it's like, um, and I've heard various, but like, I think, I think there's someone like something like the book is on something like our better natures or something like that. The pointing that like, even with the two world wars, that it was still less violent than the centuries before. Like if you take it for a percentage of the population, because obviously there weren't like millions and millions of people before that. But the fact that uh, we, we, the world is way safer than it ever used to be, generally. Yes, The Better Angels of Our Natures by Steven Pinker. Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I haven't actually read it. I just kind of listened to some of the salient points, but yeah. And then there is a book which is very surprising by Hans Rosling. Uh, he has also many, many YouTube videos where he really goes into the statistics, which everybody could go, and he has developed a system to see these things uh, graphically. And it's amazing. I mean, like this, less violence. And he has studied many, many, many ways. He didn't do the studies. He only put the, the studies together in these uh, graphs. It's, it's super surprising. It is called gapminder.com. And you can also have it on your computer. And then when you have a, a question about, you know, uh, for instance, violence, people think violence goes up. It's not, you know, and many other things we have no idea. And, what he is saying that the people who is doing our the, the decisions for us, he was doing surveys with those people and big conferences. They have no idea. They don't know. They base their decisions on on fantasy, but not on real facts because nobody makes the it takes the time to. I mean, it's difficult to to study all the the statistics. Kate, what did you say uh, enlightenment now where Pinga is? Also a good one. Okay, enlightenment now. Mm -hmm. And he's called Hans Rosling. Look it up tonight in, in YouTube. It's, it's, it's amazing. For instance, also by gender issues or whatever you want. Uh, uh, poverty in the world and, and stuff like this. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, also fun because he is like like a football commentator. He said, "Look how they are coming up and up and up and up." <laughs> and in many thing, many ways, he says in the in the sec in the f f fourth world, let's say what we would say fourth world, they are now on the stage in most things where we were in the fifties. So not so far, not so far away as we think. And the idea. How many women, uh, how many girls don't go to school nowadays? And he, 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 you can make the test. It's really, 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 really astonishing. And you see how often you are wrong. I was completely, completely astonished about that, how little I know. You can have that too, this experience. Gapminder.com. 
and Hans Rosling. I can write it in the in the chat. I would like to endorse that. It is delightful. He's an entertainer as well as everything else. And the graphics are such a delight and very clear. And he is not the only one. There are many people trying to point out things by just about any metric we choose to apply. Things are better now for not just in raw, not just in percentages, in raw numbers, but in percentages. This is the best time to be Homo sapiens on this planet. And we tend to miss that in the, the fog of our headlines that always scream about the worst news. Um, so, um, yeah, so we, we, so evolution seems to be baked in and not only that, but a good idea. But, and now we're, now we're, now that we, there is less violence, but I would say we're more conscious of it and more conscious of how to rebalance ourselves and rebalancing around the fact that nature is a brutal place and our human nature is often brutal and how do we transcend and include that too i'm not thinking of the value of the four quadrants in supporting beige that um like we've developed healthier systems lower right to support our survival and evolution but if that cultural or um some of the other quadrants aren't there uh, the systems actually leaves us at an evolutionary disadvantage in some way. If, if I can tie on uh, what you just mentioned, um, with Ryan, we had talked about universal basic income. And so in general, it seems to be as if the lower right quadrant is bringing us towards increasing levels of freedom in a sense, because we have peace, we can move around, we can do stuff, we can express and, and, and obviously, you can look at it pessimistically, which again, we concluded is just not necessarily historically accurate. But within this structure, we can still see that we're fairly not free. Like we still have to pay the bills. We still need to work. And so I, I, have, I have this belief that one of the biggest problems with Integral 3 is that we haven't come up with an economical system that clearly supports an integral mind. But I do believe that the key tenant of that economical system is freedom. But obviously it's a, it has to be like an adaptive freedom, a freedom that allows, that is based on, I don't know exactly what, but it seems to me that humans tend to do the, their best work when they're not, you know, uh, alienated. Compelled, yes. You know, sometimes is, is fear and agitation that brings our best of us, but it's not alienation and living in a factory and doing the same thing over and over again. And so I think that a lot of our mental, emotional resources are locked in beige because we all need to pay the bills. We all need to survive. You know, I mean, Karen, what you talked about, I think, it, uh, no, now she's away, but what she talked about is like panic out of financial issues. I mean, who doesn't feel that? And my suggestion is that collectively, we should put a little bit more work into thinking in terms of economical systems just so that we can all go and live in Bali and, and chill a little bit more. So I would propose as, as you know, maybe not the next one, but a subsequent call, lower right. Because we, we don't talk about that a lot. And what does lower right integral look like? I have some ideas. I, I actually have, a, like, a, I've been thinking about it a lot, but I think that that is something where we need to put a lot of minds together. Also because that's the only way to engineer enlightenment. Like, that's the only, like, if we leave it to gurus to just roam around and people becoming enlightened, it's just not going to happen. But if you engineer the incentives of society to just bring us in the right direction, we can do that. And we've seen that you can now code society. Like, if you change the algorithm of Facebook, people become happier or sadder. So we have it all in place to just really tweak society. And uh, I think, like, when you look in terms of lower right, also it, it becomes so much easier to think of a society that becomes enlightened. You just need to tweak the knobs of a you know, system that is based on causality. And now that, that the world of internet is allowing it. And I think you, Paul, you know, tied with this idea of gaming and entertainment, like those are all things we're interacting on the right base. And if we tweak them for reintegration, so you, you can watch porn, you can play your violent games, but in a way that brings you to some jo more joy, we can actually help society. So that's my lower right rant. Yeah, I think as well with that, because I'm thinking of 
I guess this is, in some ways goes completely away from beige, but in other ways not. Of like, there's so much technology technology that's like super relevant to what you're saying. Like loads of stuff that's really like, uh, kind of sci-fi within a few decades. Like um, Karen, you were talking about, and I've always wondered about the um, term centaur. Like this idea of being able to change the body. I always curious about if it relates to the subtle body and all this kind of stuff. But it's like, what happens in 50 years when there's all these nanobots? There's like 3D printing. Like people are already. Uh, I think 3D printing, I can't remember what they're doing. Like 3D printing fake meat already. Like to put, so that opens up the door of like, do we need to have all this like animal cruelty and all this kind of stuff? And there's all this like crazy sci fi things that could have this huge impact on our body that is uh, both like exhilarating and kind of terrifying. The thought of having like microscopic robots just like moving around in my nervous system and my bloodstream is like, yeah, great, maybe I can get with cancer, but some psychopath gets hold of that and uh, yeah. <laughs> so guys, I see Karen has to go. Uh, yes, I've been dashing around brushing teeth. Uh, a quote that I have, I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but um, I read it in a book a long time ago. I vacillate between is it, essentially agony and ecstasy. Uh, I vacillate between existential bliss. No, exis. Oh, gosh. Hang on one second. <laughs> Sounds big. Yeah. Uh, I hope I can find it. I vacillate between existential angst and singularity and um you guys i so wish i could have been in front of the computer i've been listening to everything you said this is fascinating um and um i'm i'm really and, and natalie i'd love to hear more about the exercises that you were speaking about with the ankle the hip and the jaw um that would be awesome for women yeah, and, yeah, and, I mean, you know, yeah and did you mention there was something different for men or is that also include men but Fascinating conversation, and um, I, I'm really um, thrilled. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out. I've got to go to church, and um, um, I wish you all a good week. And will we be talking yeah. about red next time? So, bye, everybody. I'm still listening, but I'll be out of the picture. Take care, Karen. Take care. Yeah, I think next time is purple first, or not? And red, we already sort of did that, so. It was the inspiration. So as we have a little time, uh, I think we could wrap up and everybody uh, can share what they have, let's say, learned or what was astonishing or what, what they took out of this conversation. Well, I found the conversation very affirming um, because I, I really think, you know, survival first uh, has always been kind of a base where, where, where I... Um, work from. And I like the idea that um, we need a system transformation shift that allows people to have more secure sense of survival, basic needs, and all that to be able to facilitate people to be able to expand and you know, evolve uh, at, a, at a higher personal, uh, personal growth level. Um, and I was thinking what came, came up for me is that the divide in the country uh, between the forces that believe that the um, solution is internal, and then the other forces that believe the solution is external, that if, to be able to cut through that divide and bring a more integrated approach for them to understand that we need both, you know, both the, the, the our inner self development, but also the external support. And that's to me is the, the gift of the quadrant, you know, that is so uh, comprehensive, multi dimensional, they can cut across these fragmented divisions that are really putting ourselves at stake of whether we can even survive. And um, I think this focus today has really helped me appreciate that even more, how important it is um, uh, to be able to um, awaken or connect uh, and help people to move beyond the division, you know, and find a, a, common, a common core of, um, how to be balanced both internally and external and, and, and create that kind of society that facilitates that, I think is really what historically is the imperative. Uh, 
I was listening to a talk by um, uh, one of those Ken shows with Corey and Ken and Ken, and Corey said something like, I don't know where all the integral people are. And Ken said, well, I think they all went in the closet. They're all hiding in the closet. And I'm just really glad <laughs> to see that um, because they don't have anybody to talk to. You know, they're, they're, everybody's like bashing them for everything out of their mouth. So I'm just so happy to see this closet here. This has been fantastic. I got so many insights from all of you. Thank you. Well, I'll just jump in here. Um, I'm kind of astounded that we were able to talk about beige for an hour and a half and, and we could have gone on. <laughs> and I, I really, I was talking about this, uh, talking to this, about this with Paul yesterday, but like, it seems like a lot, a lot of Ken Wilber's writings are an integral in general. There's not a lot of emphasis on lower stages, especially ones like beige. It's like people are like, I don't want, you know, it's kind of like boring or kind of banal or it's like, why we, you know, people want to go for the juicy highest ones and, and they don't want to focus on the more fundamental ones. And I think it's really, it's really great that we, all had so much to share and, and so much insight um, about us, about these lower stages that are often um, overlooked. And I think it's tremendous value, Heidi, that you know we're recording these and, and th this going step by step through each one. I, I think it's just a great idea, and I'm really excited about purple because you know I'm, Hawaii has a lot of purple and um, lot to say there. But uh, the other the other thing that I, I a theme or motif that was appearing in this conversation for me was about how there are these traumas that we have. And especially with as it relates to beige, it can be very, very deep or fundamental traumas, maybe birth traumas when we were infants. And it's almost as if sometimes the trauma can be a doorway to the divine, right? The, the trauma can be a doorway to, to open to something greater and to contact something. I think Rumi has a quote that's something like, uh, the, the, something about the wound is where the light enters or something like that. And I think I'm kind of feeling that way with uh, the, the deeper the trauma goes, like all the way down to beige, the, the deeper it can be within our psyches. And so it can be harder to access. But when we do really open to that and all the fear or anxiety that can, by opening those floodgates, it, it can really open the door to something more inspiring. So yeah, thank you everyone. This was uh, awesome. Uh, well, it does feel like that um, collective lack of interest in beige and some of those lower stages is you know quite an example of our inability to to deal with some of those fundamental problems and um for future conversations i feel really excited about exploring beige through the quadrants a little bit more um and how the system the lower right can support um development and all of the other quadrants because it feels necessary especially how um each stage development has a center of gravity in one of those quadrants and how the system can support the rest. Um, and some other ideas that I have are like float tanks for homeless people because of how womb-like that environment is, how much it removes toxins and stress from the body, and even maybe a sense of community around, um, you know, sharing that experience and how good you feel afterwards and we can kind of go on from there, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. This has been really interesting. Uh, I wanted to segue from here. Since you mentioned homeless people, like the only guru, like a real guru I ever met was this homeless guy who just like talked to me for one night. And there's this one thing that he told me that it just stuck with me and it was safety first. And he just like, and I, like when he said it, I clearly understood this idea that to, to completely let go, to completely awaken, you need to have this just basic sense of safety somehow. I think that that's really important. And to, to what you said, um, I think that the, uh, to, to what you said, Natalie, I think the idea of whenever we discuss things, you know, like levels and so on and so forth, to sort of push ourselves to use all the quadrants and all the lines and the types, could be interesting to just make sure that our conversation are integrated because otherwise obviously we're kind of pushed by the current but i think that if we did that it would also be a little bit easier maybe at some point to begin recording the insights that we gain because sort of that would make it easier to categorize them so i think that would be a great idea
Well, echoing Ryan and some others, I didn't think there would be very much to say about beige. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it turns out there was. Now, I, I have all along thought of red and purple as very juicy, but I didn't think of beige as being all that interesting. As Wow, it's juicy too. <laughs> This is a great conversation. I am looking forward to going on through all of these. Thanks. Paul, did you already? No. Um, yeah, I find it, uh, I find it really grounding. And also like, I think there's a massive part of, uh, uh, Karen actually mentioned this, like feeling alone, feeling ashamed with this like very primal stuff because I've been to therapy and things like this. And it feels like that gets fairly, uh, bypassed or kind of patronized so to have um i guess like everybody else to have like beige actually like kind of explode and be this like enormous world that's actually full of some of the most vitality it's kind of like i think my hunches were that was the case um and then to share it with a bunch of um integral people and i think uh, like, like there's a joy for me in sharing with everybody but like hearing natalie hearing damiano um even like uh, Obviously, I'm, I'm spoke too much, Kate, but like hearing that you're kind of on the fringes of dealing with like some of the worst in society, like there's this kind of um, excitement about it. Feels like uh, we and the integral people could really like um, bring something powerful in terms of like healing the body or dealing with beige or therapy and all this kind of stuff. Like there feels like this blend of kind of diverse and really strong um experiences like even even like ronald when you were talking about actually dealing with it just your personal experience and like validating um the importance of safety just feels uh just feels really vital and really important um yeah so it just felt like a great great call to me so i find it very great too and i hear and i feel the necessity to talk more and so it, during while we were speaking i had the idea should we do or a forum just for us who are here or a block a common block so where you have an idea you have an idea you have an idea to these topics we are talking about that they are connected because i saw karen sending out an email the emails get sort of lost you know so if there is I, you know? I have a collaboration platform startup if you need so yeah we need okay. set up if we want to set up like a space where we can have stuff like our profiles some conversations some groups just our privately we can set it up i would just like maybe one of you to help me out just to have like a um, someone to bounce around ideas with but i'd be happy that that would be fun to just make it available yeah exactly yeah otherwise i would have thought just block which is yeah. quick you know things like that but i i really feel uh, that we should collect this wisdom which we're bringing out and everybody who has still the idea and afterwards come the ideas that you can write them down and then we we can uh, everybody can read them and we are at the same page why when we are in the integral life thing it's all sort of you know there are other people coming in and they are i think we should keep this in the group uh, first where we were speaking so damiana we can talk about it i'm now sort of tech savvy i could help you a little bit <laughs> at least yeah and it's great and um I, as I said before, I was surprised how much a beige was in my meme stack 15 years ago. And now, lately, I realize uh, how much I'm in the survival mode, especially after my husband died and I came, went into the, the, the death mode and, you know, and being down and have slowly to get, get out of it again. And I really feel the existential necessity of safety. Uh, but not safety now because you know I'm safe that's the other thing I wanted to say often our un feeling unsafe is not real it's it's just somewhere in our psyche you know and that's uh, uh, but this survival thing it's much stronger in it I feel in my case that it comes over me you know and it's a hard sometimes at night when I'm awake I, I try to connect and you know and do exercises to get out of that but I am really surprised how much it is uh, 
raining our lives and how little we are paying attention to it. <laughs> so, so it's really great that we could talk about it. And thank you, everybody. At this point, we, we connect Damiano and then we, we let you know about begin and write your articles and your thoughts and it must not be an article but that you know what you what you want to say and we find the place where we where we put it okay see you next sunday yeah. and before we go i'd like to invite you all to just like move your heads from one side to the other because that's one of the most effective simple ways that you can deal with beige in a moment and you, Natalie, you have so many experiences. Why don't you at the beginning, at the end, lead us in some physical exercise? Ah, sure. Sounds good. good. Perfect. So, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.